Korean guys? I'm sorry. All right, good. So we got a lot of young folks. And then how many uh, folks who are in some type of professional social services, uh, medical, law enforcement, anything like that? And, 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 and which group am I missing? I'm trying to understand my audience here. Um, education. Education. Awesome, because that's the word I want to I want to lead off on, education. Um, I, I can do a lot to prosecute bad guys and work with law enforce, enforcement to catch them. But one of my favorite quotes of all time is Benjamin Franklin. Anyone know what I'm going to say? An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. Right? And education, education, education. So let me start off by just talking. Um, I'm not going to give you a speech. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories because I think stories are far more interesting than speeches. Uh, how many of you have ever seen the movie Taken? Okay, if you haven't seen Taken, that's your homework assignment. It's a great movie. It's an amazing movie. If you like action movies, if you're a parent, especially a parent of a teenage daughter, it will scare the poop out of you. It is bad. It is scary. But here's the thing. Taken illustrates a form of, a form of human trafficking that we all have kind of stereotyped. It is a stereotypical form of human trafficking. There are forms of human trafficking that exist around us right now that are existing in Columbia. South Carolina, in Charleston, in Myrtle Beach, in Greenville, in other areas. Human trafficking, or let's just call it what it is, slavery, modern day slavery, is alive and well in our country. Human trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. It is the second largest criminal industry only behind drugs and arm trafficking in the world. Um, it is the uh, fastest growing, which means in a couple of years it will be the largest industry. Do y'all know why that is? I'm a drug trafficker and I want to give you drugs. You're going to do what? Give me money, right? Then what do I have to do as a drug trafficker? I got to get more drugs from him and come back to you, right? If I'm a human trafficker, I take you and sell you to you. You, you, you give me money and then you give me what? The person back. And then I still have the commodity. I don't have to go get it again. I can use it over and over and over until that person dies or whatever. So human trafficking is very appealing to people who view this as a business. And there are people who aren't, they don't see us as human beings. They see this as a business enterprise. Just like in the movie Taken, um, that is a form of human trafficking that we, that we always focus on. And it is very important to focus on it. When South Carolina passed its human trafficking laws in 2012, we were one of the worst states in the country on enforcement of human trafficking laws. You see, we never track human trafficking statistics because we call it other things. We have statistics on child abuse, prostitution, extortion, um, and, and any number of other crimes that a victim or defendant would have been qualified under for purposes of statistical tracking. We never ask the questions. Law enforcement, prosecutors, educators, uh, social workers, victims advocates, we didn't ask the questions. So we passed a law that is totally comprehensive. It is totally comprehensive. It goes to the criminality of it. Um, if y'all remember the movie Taken, remember the man that meets the young girls, the, the two teenage girls, and he flirts with them. They share a taxi, and then he takes, he drives into Paris with them, and you know says, "Hey, come out to the party with me tonight." Um, you know, they're like, "Yeah, we'd love to go party." And he watches them go up to their condo, and he makes a phone call. And then the next scene, the guys he calls show up in ski masks and kidnap the girls from their condo. Well, under our former former laws. That guy would be treated differently uh, for purposes of human trafficking. He might be a co-conspirator, but he wouldn't be prosecuted as the principal offender. Now in South Carolina, if you own a business that you allow, allow to, uh, to launder money, like a, a, whether it's a strip club or whether it's a tanning salon or a massage parlor or a pawn shop or whatever, you can actually um, be convicted or prosecuted as if you were the person buying and selling children or people for sex or labor as if you did it yourself. We can go after you civilly. We can dissolve your business and give the damages to the individuals. Also, as a, as a victim, you can receive three times the damages what would it cost you. We can actually use it as an affirmative defense uh, against prostitution. If you're a minor, you obviously wouldn't be prosecuted. But there are lots of things that we can do now that we couldn't do before, or that we can do better. Um, there's a story that illustrates another kind of human trafficking. I heard this about three years ago from a woman named Teresa Flores. She's, you Google her, Teresa with the T-H-E-R-E-S-A. Have you heard her story? Teresa Flores. Teresa tells the story. She is a young 15-year-old girl in the late 80s. 
and she is in her local high school, and she is at her locker one day, and a young man walks up to her, uh, a boy in her class, and she said that I was very attracted to him. I was, I thought he was cute. Now, Teresa, you give a little background, Teresa. She was middle of the bell curve. This is how she described herself. She goes, I was average looks, I was average grades, you know, I was average everything. Middle class, average popularity. So this boy that she likes, now, any teenagers, teenage girls or boys, we all have egos. Someone that you think attractive walks up to you, you're gonna, you're gonna feed off of that. He started talking to her and asked, offered her a ride home. Of course, she accepted. And he drove her out of the school parking lot and turned right instead of left. Her house is to the left and she says, where are we going? He says, I gotta make a stop quick. So I, um, just, just bear with me. So she said, okay. He pulls into a yard, uh, a house a few miles up the road, says, I gotta go inside for a minute. Why don't you come in and have a soda pop? She's like, I really need to get home. I really need to get home. Uh, my, my mom and dad are expecting me before dark. She felt uncomfortable. But he says, he, he said the three words that she says any 15 year old girl with self esteem issues would wanna hear. I like you, hooked her. She followed him inside, he offered her a drink. Next thing she knows, she wakes up three hours later. I will clean the story up a little bit for the audience. She had been raped and she wasn't clothed and there was evidence to suggest that she had been assaulted. She leaves the house, he is not there. She leaves, she goes home, she doesn't say anything to her mother because see, she had been conceived prior to wedlock and she grew up in a very strict, uh, devout Catholic family and her mom had made a mistake, uh, got pregnant before marriage and of course told Teresa, you ever do the deed before marriage, you're out. Now her mother would not have thrown her out. That was what she was saying to scare the girl straight. But Teresa couldn't reconcile in her head that, that that's what her mother meant, so she kept it quiet. She shows up at school the next day. The boy approaches her at the locker with an envelope of photos, hands it to her. She opens it up and it's pictures of him and several friends assaulting her as she lies unconscious. He says, we're going to give you a chance to work these off. We're going to call you from time to time and you're going to do what we say when we say. And if you don't do it, we're going to spread these pictures all over the place. We're going to destroy your reputation. And if you tell anyone what we're doing, we'll kill you. So 15-year-old Teresa gets the first phone call that first night. Her parents are already asleep. She climbs down the lattice from the second story of her house in her pajamas barefoot, runs across the grass, down the sidewalk to the corner intersection of her, of her neighborhood, crawls into the back of a Trans Am that drives her across town where she is taken to a palatial mansion. She is led downstairs and she uh, walks through a room of 30 men into a back room where each of those men is come, brought in and she is sold over and over and over and over. This happens three, four, five times a week for the next two years. Teresa wasn't kidnapped. Teresa wasn't backpacking through Europe. Her parents didn't know. Her priests didn't know. Her friends at school didn't know. Her teachers didn't know. Her guidance counselor, her principals, the SROs, nobody knew. She went home every day. She was in the house, but she was coerced. She was threatened. She wasn't kidnapped. Our laws actually cover that. It covers psychological coercion too. It, it, you don't have to be forced at gunpoint or knife point or taken or held against your will. You can be trafficked without actually being taken, like the movie. Our, our state covers that now. Teresa got out of the lifestyle, but it took her two years. And her, her story of redemption and salvation is another story. But I tell you the first part of her story, because she travels the country now working on educating folks like me and others about how they can make their laws better. And she's married with kids now, so things ended up well for her, and that's another story. But my, sto my takeaway for you is that this story affected me because it changed the way I saw human trafficking. It can happen anywhere. Do you know that we have active cases going on right now in South Carolina under the new laws? So we are investigating cases right now. And it's not just the sex trade, it's the labor trade. It's labor trafficking is there too. So um, we have, uh, and I will reserve uh, in the, for, the, for the Q and A period, I have two other speakers I think coming up right behind me. So I'm gonna step down in just a second. And I have a lot more to say, I just don't have the time to say it. And there are other people here who have stories to tell you that you need to hear. But we have a, a human trafficking state plan that my office has been the pr principal coordinator on. And I will talk about that. If you want me to, if you want to talk about that, ask me questions about that in the Q&A period. And I also have staff here I want to introduce you to. But remember, the most important thing we can do is educate ourselves and not be ignorant to the fact that it is happening. It is not stuff that happens in a movie or happens in a third world country or in a big metropolitan city across the, city across the country. 
It happens in our communities, and it is staring us in the face. Sometimes we just don't even know that it's there. So, uh, being educated is the first line of defense. It's protection and education starts at the individual. The government can only do so much. I can't be with you 24-7, although I wish it could be. You wouldn't want that, but, but you are your first line of defense and the first line of defense for your team. So, um, I'll take any questions at the appropriate time, but I just wanted y'all to know that it's an honor to work with uh, groups like this and to talk to communities like you because you're each and now an ambassador to educate people of the horrors of human trafficking and that it does exist in our community. So thank you for having me here today and I look forward to hearing from you in a, in a little bit.